A Martian scientist with no understanding of visual perception could understand the rainbow or lightning or clouds as physical phenomena, though he would never be able to understand the human concepts of rainbow, lightning, or cloud, or the place these things occupy in our phenomenal world. Nat, we are back at Made You Think. We are for another interesting, philosophically motivated episode. I think we've talked about this piece a number of times on the show. Oh, yeah. And we decided it was time to just go ahead and read it and take some notes and talk about it with y'all. Yep. Uh, Yeah, I think you mentioned this way back in one of probably the first few episodes, maybe the Godel Escher Bach one. It probably came up in GEB, yeah. Yeah. Which everyone should go listen to if they haven't yet. Phenomenal episode. (laughs) If we should say so ourselves. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, if we say so ourselves. <laughs> but uh, this this essay that we're talking about today, or What Is It Like to Be a Bat by Thomas Nagel, definitely touches on a lot of the themes of consciousness that came up in GEB, in Way of Zen, in Homo Deus, in other episodes as well. <laughs> Darwin's Dangerous Idea, probably. Yeah, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, definitely. Uh, Beginning of Infinity. Yep. Uh, it's it's a, a broadly relevant discussion. And a lot of people uh, who have, and I guess just to give a brief overview, it's about kind of theory of mind and consciousness. I would say that's probably the broad level of what this, of what this article is about. But uh, a lot of people who are influential in that space have read and cited, you know, this article um, and this argument. It's probably one of the most famous pieces on the mind body problem. Right. Because Nagel was writing this at a time when physicalism and materialism was very popular, and the piece is a refutation to physicalism, right? The idea that you can reduce all aspects of the mind to simply firings in the brain, right? And he's not necessarily refuting physicalism here, but he is posing a big challenge to it, right? I I think when you, at least when I read the Wikipedia summary, it it says that the thesis is an attempt to refute reductionism. But to me, it doesn't feel like an attempted refutation, but rather exposing a big hole in it. Yeah. And basically saying that you can't take reductionism seriously until this hole is filled and it's not filled. Right. That's how I took it as well. Yeah. Yeah. We have to admit that at the very least, reductionism and physicalism are, are flawed and incomplete as philosophies right now. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I don't think he was trying to necessarily refute it. I I think he even said something about that in the beginning. Yeah. Well, actually, at the end, he says something about that. Let me see. Um, Yeah, I have it. I mean, it's too it's super long. So uh, (laughs) I'll I'll just summarize it. But yeah, I mean, it's basically he's giving his caveats for why he's doing the essay. And um, he says uh, this part I can quote from the actual essay says every reductionist has his favorite analogy from modern science. It is most unlikely that any of these unrelated examples of successful reduction will shed light on the relation of mind to brain. And, uh, you know, he goes on to say um, basically that without consciousness, the mind body problem would be much less interesting. With consciousness, it seems hopeless. Basically, what he's saying is even just getting to the mind, like the idea of what is a mind from a body uh, through a reductionist method, you know, kind of through the sum of its parts is pretty difficult. And then he said, when you add consciousness on top of that, uh, he doesn't think that a reductionist approach can even get close to solving that problem. Yeah, he's got a similar line at the end where he says, it seems unlikely that any physical theory of mind can be contemplated until more thought has been given to the general problem of subjective and objective. Yeah, and that's kind of what he uh, finishes with. And in that last paragraph, in the second paragraph, sorry, there was one other line in there that was uh, relevant to what he's attempting to do in this in this essay, uh, where he says, perhaps a new theoretical form can be devised for the purpose being uh, this mind, body and consciousness problem. Um, but such a solution, if it exists, lies in the distant intellectual future. Yeah. So, yeah, it's incomplete, basically. And in that way, it kind of reflects Dennett and what he talks about in Beginning of Infinity. And it, is, it was interesting reading the Wikipedia article on this essay because I guess Dennett and Nagel were sort of intellectual rivals and they would challenge each other's stuff a lot. And Dennett actually has responses to what it, what is it like to be a bat? But it also feels like Dennett's idea and, uh, or sorry, I'm thinking of David Deutsch, not Daniel Dennett. I always mix them up. Yeah. Uh, Deutsch's 
Okay, so forget everything I just said about Dennett fighting Nagel, although that is relevant to stuff from Darwin's Dangerous Idea, and we'll get there. But what I was going to say is that Nagel's stuff reflects Deutsch and what he brings up in Beginning of Infinity about, you know, all problems are soluble given enough intelligence and time. Right? It doesn't feel like Nagel is saying that it's impossible for us to understand subjective experience from, you know, objective mechanics of the brain. We're just not there yet. And we can't even begin to talk about physicalism or materialism until or reductionism until we solve that problem and bridge that gap yeah and i think um i mean i think what he's saying is yeah we're not anywhere close yet right from a philosophical standpoint to get there well there's also this interesting element of kind of something nagel is bringing up which is that physicalism and reductionism in some ways rely on creating an objective interpretation of reality but we cannot have an objective interpretation of reality because any thought that we have is colored by our subjective view of the world, right? Exactly. It's like there will always be some subjective filter for any information that you take in, and it's impossible to remove that filter as a human. And so any discussion of you know objectivity is somewhat silly because we really can't be objective as much as we would like to be yeah and i guess he uses a bat as the way to show like illustrate this concept to you because uh and i think he says in the in the essay um a bat is similar enough in the sense that it's still a mammal he said if you go to insects people have a lot of trouble um even trying to imagine themselves as that thing but it's far enough away and and it has senses that we do not we can't even comprehend like echolocation uh, that we have no idea what that would even be like. So it's a really good way to kind of demonstrate to you that there is, well, his, I guess his take on it, right, is there is no way to experience what it is like to be a bat. Right. And and that is kind of a way of highlighting the fact that we can't really understand subjective experience from objective data. Right. And so Dennett responds to that where he basically says that any interesting or theoretically important feature of a bat's consciousness could be amenable to third-party observation. For instance, it is clear that bats cannot detect objects more than a few meters away because echolocation has a limited range. But uh, I think Nagel would say, yes, but you don't know what it is like to not be able to sense something more than a few meters away. Yeah. You can know that they cannot do that, but you do not know what it is like to not be able to do that. Right. Right. And that's, that's really the crux of a lot of what he's saying is that there is this what it is like aspect to our consciousness, a subjective experience that's not captured by the objective phenomenon. Yeah, 100%. And I have to say that Nagel's argument feels tighter than Dennett's. And maybe I, you know, I haven't read Dennett's exact response, like the full context of his response here. So it could just be, you know, I'm just glossing over what he was actually saying. But like, I buy Nagel's argument here because, yeah, we can, we can, say what the effects of you know echolocation for example are and we can observe that as a third party but we can't really observe what that feels like and he uses the example later like way later in the essay um, of trying to describe to somebody who's been blind from birth what the color red looks like yeah right and like yeah you can try to describe it but there's no real way to experience you know for that person who's blind to know in in a true sense what what you're talking about Right. He gives the example of you can say the color red is like a the sound of a trumpet, right? Yeah. And that gives you a little bit of the phenomenology, but it is certainly not a complete mirror of the experience. Yeah, or even not even close, really. Not even close. Because it's like humans humans can learn to echolocate, actually. That's pretty cool. Yeah, if given enough time and practice. Have you seen that video of the blind mountain biker? No, but that sounds awesome. Yeah, there's a guy who I think he, he was either born blind or was blind from a very young age. Yeah, Bobby McMullen. And he's either completely blind or mostly blind. And he can use sort of echolocation and other sensory experiences to mountain bike, which is pretty badass. That's really badass. <laughs> yeah. But even even that is not the same as echolocating like a bat the way a bat would. Yeah. Right. And that, that's part of Nagel's point here is that even if you could echolocate, it would not be the same as what it is like to be a bat 
echolocating. Yeah. Right. And it's not even sufficient to imagine yourself being a bat and imagine yourself like flying around and having webbed arms and stuff because that too is colored by the experience of you, right? You you can never step fully out of your own subjective interpretation of reality, which is very, you know, like strange loopy from GEB, right? Like you, right, exactly. You can't ever get outside the system. It's the the incompleteness theorem of subjective experience, right? Like if it's a sufficient system for yourself, it can never completely explain something outside of you. And, you know, that that presents problems not just for our own, you know, understanding our own consciousness, right? But also for understanding the consciousness of anyone else or anything else, too. Yeah, I think this also applies to understanding other humans, right? Where, like, you and I, let's say, come from fairly similar backgrounds, same college, you know, like, we grew up in nearby or even though we didn't know each other uh so like we can understand each other and re- generally get what the other person's experience is of course like nagel would argue and I, I would agree i can never know exactly what it's like to be net because uh, even <laughs> just trying to imagine it right is colored by my own experience but imagine trying to you know understand a maasai tribe member or an amazon tribe member or you know someone who's been a monk in tibet for <laughs> you know their entire life like it's yeah. just It's another type of experience that even if you put yourself in their shoes, you know, you'll never really be like, I think Nagel's point is that you'll never really understand what it's like to be that person. You'll just understand what it's like to imagine being that person. Yeah. Well, quick, quick sidebar. I think if I ever write an autobiography, I should absolutely title it. What is it like to be a gnat? (laughs) 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 <laughs> nobody would get that joke except for like you and five other people whoever's listening to this podcast yeah they, they would get it <laughs> um, but no that I, I was gonna go off of your point and you know say that that's something i've noticed a lot with uh what you know for lack of a better term we can call the post-trump era or the, the trump era yeah is a lot of these arguments about people being so stupid for voting for him And it's like, yeah, but you're making that judgment based off of, you know, one, your experience of life up until this point, and two, your view of reality, right? Right. And it's really easy to judge someone else for acting differently based off information you have. Yeah, which they might not have, or they may not benefit from that information the same way that you do. Yeah, or they just might have completely different information or completely different values, right? Like, I think my the best example of this is a lot of, I would say like urban Democrats will be confused slash make fun of rural Republicans for voting Republican because, you know, Republicans traditionally don't support welfare programs that would help, you know, these rural people who are losing jobs and, you know, need more support. And so it's like, well, why would they, you know, why would they vote against their own interests? Like they're so stupid or they're so confused or whatever. And it's like, well, they just have different interests, right? It's like somebody might care more about, you know, other social policies and less about the welfare stuff that you care so much about. But it's really easy to judge someone and think they're acting irrationally based off of information that you have when they could be acting completely reasonably based off their information and their life experience. And you could be the irrational one, right? It's really easy to attribute irrationality and stupidity to other people when you try to view their actions from your subjective experience oh yeah 100 percent. or even their reaction to uh let's say like technology right so we we meaning most people probably who are listening to this podcast we know that okay over time technology brings costs down and improves everyone's standard of living and obviously like you know the people who are bitching about capitalism on their iPhone when they're tweet, you know, using Twitter and like, like, obviously, those things are all developed by like through capitalism. I get it. Right. But you can see, uh, let's say somebody whose job has been automated away, for example, you can see why they would be wary of um, technology, but then not fully understand when you have, I don't know, I could imagine a candidate coming in and saying, Oh, we're going to make more investments in technology, then the person who's lost their job through technology looks at that and is like, fuck that. Right. Because like the more the economy moves in that direction, the less I'm likely to get employed. And so you might say, oh, well, objectively, right, technology is going to bring all their costs down. It's going to create these robots that do stuff for you and self-driving cars and all this good stuff. But their value system is just it's totally different. And they're honestly, their lived experience is totally different uh, than ours. So 
Yeah, but it's hard to put yourself in their shoes, right? Because like I've definitely had that initial or visceral reaction when I see, let's say, people um, even with just like voting in a direction that I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. But you have to catch yourself, right? And be like, well, take a step back. You don't know what that's like. Right. It's hard to do. It's really hard to do. Yeah, it is hard to do. But I, I always... And like, obviously, I don't think that we're particularly any better at it than most people. Maybe we're a little better because we have to do this podcast. And so we have to try to think about things a little, a little bit more. But I, I always find that whenever I think people are being irrational or stupid, unless it's, you know, a cult situation, there's usually a deeper reasoning for it that makes sense if you can figure it out or try to understand their view, right? Like this, this is one that, um, or I, I always struggled with understanding why anybody would be pro-life, right? Like against women having abortion rights. Yeah. But if you truly believe that life starts at conception, which isn't a crazy stance to have, right? Like, right. you know, you, you have to draw that line somewhere and it's not crazy to draw that line at conception versus, you know, birth versus six months, whatever. Right. And so, yeah, if you truly believe that, then abortion is murder, right? Yeah. But when it's framed as, oh, these people don't want women to have rights or don't want women to have. <laughs> yeah, then it's totally different. You know, the choice of what to do with their body. Then it's like, oh, that's insane. Why would anybody believe that? And it's like, well, because that's not why they believe that. <laughs> exactly. You know, it, it's not like an anti-woman thing. There's a much better reason for their beliefs. But depending on how you characterize it, it can seem crazy or irrational. And I think we got into some of this discussion in uh, Riddle of the Gun, too. Yeah, exactly. Because that's another one, right? Where it's like, oh, these crazy people. Underappreciated episode. It is. Yeah. More people should go listen to that one. That was a good episode. Yeah. I wonder why that didn't play out as well. Maybe maybe people listened to it for five minutes and were like, these guys aren't bashing guns like 100%. So we're out. <laughs> well, but that, that wouldn't affect downloads because they would have had that's to download true. it for, for that to happen. So maybe we needed a better title. Yeah. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. We should have titled it like Nat and Neil buy firearms or something. <laughs> Why you should get a gun. That would that would be more clickbaity. Yeah. Maybe we'll experiment with that. No. I'm actually gonna go buy a gun in a couple of weeks. I'm kind of excited. Well you're you're gonna be a Texan, so Yeah, yeah. I think it's required. Hat, cowboy boots, and gun. It is. It's like if you are living somewhere. I think you were in violation last time you were there. Yeah, I was. I lived there for nine months and I never bought a gun. And so I didn't feel right. I know. You you got lucky. The authorities, you know, they didn't come search your house. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was why they kicked me out. They're like, sorry. Yeah, that's, stay, why you, sir. that's why you only lasted nine months. <laughs> <laughs> you have too few guns. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that's like another one where it's... um. It's easy if you live in like a city or a place where, uh, I mean, just the easiest example is is just like your belief that the police are there, which, you know, I think you can argue either way. But if you live in like a rural area that's like, you know, 30 minutes from the nearest police station, mm -hmm. you probably don't have the police to protect you <laughs> in any dire extreme circumstance. Yeah, I mean, not even that. Just imagine being a single mother living in a poor neighborhood where the police are slow and or unlikely to respond, right? Right. It's pretty rational then. It's basically your only good form of self-defense. Yeah, it would almost be stupid not to have some kind of gun in that situation. Yes, exactly. But that's one where uh, I, I definitely have found people have a hard time putting themselves in the other side's position. It's a very emotional one. Yeah, well, th these topics that get really politicized, you know, yeah, that seem to cut strongly on party lines. I think that, and this is probably a fault partially of the media. What isn't a fault of the media? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, very one-sided like accounts of stuff, right? Is that um, it, it makes it easier for you to assume that it's like, oh, everybody who disagrees with me is like stupid and misinformed and like I have the truth about the matter, right? Right. Especially if you're only looking at media sources that confirm what you already believe. Yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, what's that podcast? Pod Save America? Oh, yeah. I, I've only listened to one episode of that, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they're, you know, they're not really accurately reporting on anything. Right. It's just kind of like a liberal circle jerk. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, you know, you and I are both not anti-liberal or anything, but listening to something from either side of the aisle that is so blatantly kind of misconstruing or tweaking what's going on to create you know tribal support is frustrating right right and i, I think it's a, it's a big part of how we've ended up in such a um i think divided political sphere right yeah and i don't know how you reverse that and i don't i don't know if it can be reversed too easily but yeah it's like yeah. when everybody can choose their information source 
logically they're going to want sources they agree with. Or ones that make them feel good. Right? Exactly. Yep. So it's weird. It's like this is one example where maybe decentralization makes it really hard to create a cohesive story and narrative for a population. Yeah. You know, it's you almost want like a philosopher king writing the news. Yeah. <laughs> you need like Plato's Republic, but for the media, not for the government. Well, even beyond that, right? It's like when there were only like one or two media sources or whatever number of channels there were, like three. Yeah, like three TV channels. Yeah. Yeah. It's like even if they were wrong, like or false, even if the news was fake, at least it was a shared belief, right? It was like we all believe the same fake things. Whereas mm. now it's like every every side thinks the other side is completely faking it, right? But their side is not. I think you were tweeting something about this, like or similar to this earlier. Yeah. Right. Where you were saying there's that phenomenon where you read a piece of news that's about your field and it's bullshit, but then you assume the rest of the news is real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's called the, I think it's like the gel man hypothesis. Hold on. Because somebody responded and pointed out, yeah, the gel man amnesia effect. Yeah. So you you can read the news, talk about something that you know a ton about, like, you know, for for you, maybe you read an article about the beer industry in America and you're just like, wow, that is so incredibly wrong. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> that is not what's true on the ground at all. But then you might turn the page and read something about what's going on in, you know, the Middle East or something that's going on in, you know, Tesla or whatnot and be like, oh, wow, that that's really concerning, right? You'll, you'll believe it. Yep. You won't kind of extrapolate from, well, if they're so wrong about this field that I know a lot about, then they're probably wrong about everything else they're reporting on. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I mean, they're journalists are almost never trained to actually understand what they're reporting on. Yeah. It's kind of scary once you see like how the news is actually made or once you see how media actually works. Yeah. Like, did you ever sign up or hear of uh, help a reporter out? Yeah. Harrow. Harrow. Yeah. I mean, hey, it's a good service, whatever. Like, I don't have a problem with the service. It's more of like they are, if you read the requests, they already have the story they're looking for. And then they're just looking for a quote that backs it up. Yep. That's pretty much everything on there. Which is fucking scary. Like, it means that they're not, they're basically only looking for experts who already agree with the core premise of the article. Yeah, exactly. They they don't seem to care about getting a balanced take on the issue. (laughs) They've, They've got their headline. A balanced take or if they're wrong, then... Like imagine, I'm just imagining, let's say somebody posts an article, like in, you know, what the article they're writing is, they're looking for experts to quote, and they might get like 10 responses, but only one person agrees with them. Yep. So they take the one person. Yeah. Which is wild. It's also, I mean, hilariously easy to game. You know, this is one of the, yep. <laughs> um, R- Ryan Holiday had his whole thing when his book was coming out. Trust me, I'm lying, where he just tricked the, like, even like New York Times reporters, I think. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> he fooled into thinking that he was an expert on like record collections and uh, somebody else like farming or so it was just completely wild stuff and he just made shit up in response to Harold requests and it got printed in you know major newspapers it's like okay well they're not really checking their sources at all no which is yeah which is crazy but yeah i think like so there's that effect and then there's also the uh the idea that these days especially if you're on one side or the other you always think that the other side's media is biased right right but yours is perfect Yours is, there's nothing wrong with your sources. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm just very tempting. Yep. All right. Like, uh, that's a, that's a good example. Well, just like people who watch MSNBC versus watch Fox, right? Like people who watch Fox are like, oh, I don't watch MSNBC because it's so biased. And people who watch MSNBC are like, I can't believe you watch Fox News. It's so biased. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and even, I mean, it's like, you just kind of have to assume that everything is super biased now. Exactly. You have to try to get to the source and figure it out yourself. Right. Even for things like science related, like especially for things science related too. Yeah, you've got to, I mean, learning how to read research articles is a pretty important skill these days. Definitely. Because if you just read, you know, news reports of them, you'd be pretty confused. There have been times, there was one a couple weeks ago, which I, I can't remember what it is right now off the top of my head, but there was a report, an article that was talking about a, a paper that came out where the article basically came to the exact opposite conclusion of what the report, what the research was saying. Yeah, it's remarkable how bad reporters can be at reading research articles. Yeah. Right. Or like, you know, again, misunderstanding statistics from two episodes ago. Yes, <laughs> that's another common one. Three episodes ago, I guess. All right. Like, remember the one when there was all that media coming out about how uh, bacon is as bad for you as smoking? Yes, I remember that. 
the, they were basing that off of processed meats being classified as a class one carcinogen, but that just meant that there is an established link between consumption of that and cancer. But the 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 cancer risk for processed meat was something like a fifty percent increase in risk of colorectal cancer, which means you go from about a one percent to a one point five percent risk. Whereas you know if you smoke, you've got a fifty percent chance. Right of getting lung cancer and dying. <laughs> yeah. So it's not you know comparable at all. But if you can miss, if you are bad enough at reading the research or at spinning the story, it's pretty easy to make people think that oh, bacon's as bad as smoking. Right. Especially most people just saw the headline. Yeah. Right. Most people didn't even read it nearly as much as you did. Or or the the did you see the thing about coconut oil? Yeah, I saw that. Where it was like <laughs> coconut oil isn't good for you, and literally the reasoning of that article was coconut oil has saturated fat and we all know saturated fat is bad for you therefore coconut oil is bad for you yeah it was like what a deep analysis (laughs) (laughs) hilariously lazy argument but i know it's like you didn't even dig one level deep at all to what saturated fat is (laughs) yeah i mean but again it's you know when when you see people having or you know sharing any belief like it's hard to accept it but they're usually not crazy or irrational or mean-spirited right like it's really easy to attribute all of those to other people who do things you disagree with but what's that term it's like it's not occam's razor it's the other razor razor don't attribute to malice what can be explained by like ignorance or incompetence yeah hanlon's razor there we go well i guess in applying that to even these reporters right i mean they're they're not doing it necessarily maliciously they're doing it for what I can imagine one of two reasons or maybe both reasons. One, it works. Mm-hmm. People click on it. Yeah, it gets clicks. People read it. Yeah. And that's what they're ultimately being judged on, you know, these days, especially. And then the second thing is a lot of these uh, sites, they're effectively like content farms, right? So they need to turn out a bunch of articles and, you know, you don't have enough time to fact check every little thing uh, and right. still meet all your deadlines. So, And you can always publish a retraction later if you get something seriously wrong. Exactly. Yeah. So there's, you can kind of see why they do it. It doesn't make it good. Right. But it's, you can see, you can try to put yourself in their shoes and see like, okay, there's, they're not doing it necessarily maliciously. It's just the system is not set up for success. Yeah, exactly. And and this is sort of what Nagel is getting at, right? Is that we all have a subjective character of experience that we cannot step outside of and that we cannot fully describe in a way that it would be you know, obviously in a way that would be understandable to people who aren't human, but even closer to home, we can't explain it in a way that would be understandable to another human, right? You can get close, but you can never fully know what it is like to be someone else. And that makes it, you know, like we've been talking about really hard to understand a lot of these disagreements and things. Yeah. Because I think, I think, you know, tribally we're wired to assume kind of like the worst in other people. (laughs) Yeah. For lack of a better way of putting it. Right. It's like, oh, they must be stupid or wrong or confused. Like I have the truth, they don't. Exactly. Um, well, taking a slightly different, slightly different tack, the um this idea about conscious mental states. Uh, I I mean, I didn't do enough research on this beforehand, but how exactly do they define or test for consciousness in an animal? I don't think we have a definition for it. Right, because that's what it, I, that's what I got from the article, I, but I didn't know if maybe there was something new or something different about that. Um, doesn't seem like there's a good way to know. Let's look it up. Animal awareness is the quality or state of self awareness within an animal, or of being aware of an external object or something within itself. Okay, so there's a few scientific approaches. There's the mirror test. Oh, that's kind of interesting. The mirror test is a test done where the skin of an animal or human infant is marked while it's asleep or sedated with a mark that cannot be directly seen but is visible in a mirror. The animal is then allowed to see its reflection in a mirror. If the animal spontaneously directs grooming behavior towards the mark, that's taken as an indication that it is aware of itself. So self-awareness this way has been reported in apes, elephants, Bottlenose dolphins, killer whales, magpies, and pigeons. Magpies and pigeons is pretty interesting. That's really interesting. Wouldn't have expected that. Yeah. 
Well, and then I was going to ask like the other where I was leading to with that was um, and I found a article. It wasn't the article I was looking for, but it was about plant consciousness. And uh, uh, apparently Charles Darwin actually started that debate back in 1880 because he was observing that you can stress out plants where they like remember. Yeah. Like what was stressing them out. And now they've also found that certain types of trees can communicate with each other through their roots. Right. But it's like it's again, it's where do you draw that definitional line because it's like they're obviously not conscious in the same way that humans are but it's like neither is a bat right but they are probably conscious <laughs> yeah right it's like it's very hard to know it's an interesting question yeah uh here i'll just put this article in the chat and um it's not the full there was a full one about trees but this is somewhat it, it, it links to a lot of stuff in this oh cool well and it's like i mean and this is a big part of the ai discussion too right is You know, it's not really just is a computer, could a computer be conscious, but like, what would it, what would that even mean? Right. Because I think that the Turing test, we can fairly confidently say is insufficient. It's like a nice idea and it was a landmark paper, but being able to emulate a conversation doesn't really tell us that it's conscious, right? This was in beginning of infinity, right? We'd have to see how it was doing that because if it's doing it, um, Chinese room style, right? Uh, Sir, John Searle, then that's insufficient. If it just, you know, has a hundred million pre-programmed responses to different inputs, right? Then that's not conscious, but kind of like how in Go to Lesher Bach, right? Yeah. Didn't Hofstetter say if you can win a game of chess as a computer, again, a computer can beat a human in chess, right? A grandmaster in chess, that would indicate consciousness or intelligence, I guess, right? But then we found out that, yeah, they can do that, but it's it's um what is it? It's brute force yeah oh yeah you know what that was in geb there was another book we read that pointed out that being able to beat anyone at chess would not be sufficient but being able to say i don't want to play chess right now might be right that was geb was that in geb okay i think he gave the second that was like his own counter argument to himself got it yeah well he was okay so he was arguing that if a computer could beat a human at chess, it could also choose not to play chess. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, like it could say, oh, I want to listen to music instead, right? And like that's what he was thinking is in order to be powerful enough to beat a, a master at chess, uh, the computer would have had to have developed, uh, I guess, general awareness or general intelligence. But I think what we found is that, or maybe what he didn't anticipate is how rapidly computers would uh, improve in processing speed and allow you to do a brute force method. Because that's what they do. It's like a tree search, right? Of the possible moves and then the likelihood of winning. Yeah, it's it's some sort of tree search plus algorithmic refinement, right? Because they, they can't fully brute force it. Yeah. Because there's too many possibilities, I think. Or maybe that's not true for chess anymore. I know for Go, they couldn't brute force it. Yep. For Go, that's definitely true. Yeah, they had to be more creative than that. But yeah, chess, they might be able to brute force. It's probably enough processing power now. But yeah, but we don't see computers saying, I don't want to play chess. Yeah, exactly. That that hasn't happened yet. Or saying <laughs> you try to open up Skype and it's a, it just says I don't feel like it today. Well, that's every time I try to open Skype. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not saying it out loud, but I can tell that's what it's thinking. <laughs> Piece of shit program. <laughs> hey, Microsoft might have developed intelligence and unleashed it in Skype. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. So I'm tired of your 40 minute intros to your episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, it's it's weird thinking about this question, though, because I, I'd never thought about it too seriously in animals, you know, consciousness in animals until I saw Pepper dream mm. because she very clearly. Well, I guess not very clearly, but she seems to dream. Right. Because she'll be asleep and then she'll, you know, make little like whimper noises and be moving her paws like she's running. Mm. And, you know, the way you might see like a human kind of flail around in their sleep and you know, to me, that's sort of like physical evidence that there is a mental experience associated with it, right? If I am doing that while I'm asleep, I'm probably like running or scared or something in a dream. And so if she is doing that, then is there something it is like to be a dog dreaming, right? Is there like a mental representation of that, right? Like how similar is it to us or is it just, you know, or even all the smells that a dog experiences, yeah, well, I mean, that's like a whole, that's a whole separate thing. Right. Right. I, I'm just talking about the, the mental experience, right? Because we, I think most of us at least like to think of most animals as kind of being somewhat automatons, right? They're just reacting to inputs. They're not really thinking about things. Right. But if they can dream, then 
it seems like there must be some sort of mental visual experience for them, right? Yeah. If they can hallucinate while sleeping in a way that would manifest physically, there must be like visual mental representations for those animals. Yeah. I would assume. I would agree with that. And actually it leads to two different conclusions. Well, one different one conclusion, but it depends which side of it you end up on. I mean, one conclusion is that every animal has, you know, well, not every animal, but every animal that can do those things that you just mentioned uh, has a level of consciousness and awareness of self in the same way that a human does, maybe not to the extreme that a human does, but in the same fundamental way. Or the other conclusion is that we all actually are the same, right? And that, you know, maybe if they're automatons, we're automatons too. <laughs> yeah. Right. And uh, we think we have, we have this illusion of experience of, of self and illusion of awareness which in a, and in a really tough way that's true too right is that mm -hmm. that like we know the self is somewhat of an illusion uh, well we don't know but we strongly suspect through things like uh, what we read about an elephant in the brain and some of the other books is that the self is homo deus yeah yeah the self is not just necessarily like what we think of as i right isn't necessarily an actual thing yeah when i think that's part of the challenge in this essay too is that nagel is definitely trying to keep the sense of self exactly right uh and i think the one you know potential challenge to him is the this thing you're trying to hold on to the mind the sense of self is an illusion right there is not really anything special for what we think of as consciousness and i think the challenge with that is that he could easily come back and say well that doesn't solve the explanation it just sort of ignores it yeah. <laughs> right. Because you still have to try to explain what it is like to be a human, because there is clearly something it is like, even if that distinct self, right, the, the mind that is not the brain doesn't exist, that phenomenology still does. Right. And we still can't explain the phenomenology. Right. And that's the big challenge with people like Yuval Noah Harari and Sam Harris and anyone who says that, you know, there is no self, there is no mind. It's just the brain. It's like, well, you know, I remember you saying that and I'm here listening <laughs> to you and like yeah. there's something going on up here. So what is that? And then you just kind of like hit a wall where you can't really go anywhere after that. So, and that's kind of, I mean, he's highlighting that, right? That, that's a big part of Nagel's essay. Yeah. It's just to point that out that, okay, even if you say that, well, he doesn't say the self thing, but I guess that's what he's implying with the reductionism. Right. Right. That's what it seems. Um, yeah. But even like, it's kind of what he's highlighting is that even if, if you say that's true, it doesn't seem to be true in terms of everybody's subjective experience. Exactly. And just that, you know, again, even if it is true, it doesn't help us. Right. Because I feel like what Nagel is trying to do is, you know, in challenging reductionism, it feels like he's pushing for a more helpful theory of mind because a theory of mind that just says, well, it's all, you know, mental, you know, firing in the brain, just ones and zeros, neurons turning on and off. It's like, all right, that might be true, but it doesn't help me understand my mind or your mind or you know, Pepper's mind or, right. or anything like that. Right. And so how do we create a more helpful theory of mind Then we, we have to ex try to figure out how to explain purely subjective phenomena. And we still can't do that. I mean, that even applies to things like when people say that dreams are the subject or not the subjective, but the random firing of neurons, which like probably is has a, you know, a root in truth. But if, if you examine a dream, it's like definitely not random. No, there's there's enough order. You're definitely telling yourself a story. Right, right. Like there's enough structure there that it's not random. Like random would just be some psychedelic type experience. <laughs> yeah, it would just be colors and, you know, floating. And But there's, you know, there's still time. There's still time. There's still fam usually a, either a familiar place or people or things that you are aware of. Like, and they're structured. They're not, you know, someone's arm is here and their head is somewhere else. I mean, that can happen in your dream, but... It's usually like an actual person. So maybe right. it's like random constructions or your brain trying to make sense of stories, but certainly doesn't. It's saying it's a random firing of neurons seems to be, uh, you know, oversimplification. Insufficient. Yeah. 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 This theory of mind stuff is so interesting, especially with AI. Yeah. That, that's definitely where it just becomes so relevant is that if we can't, well, it, it either it becomes relevant or it will be shown to not matter. Right. Right. Because. You know, my my feeling about artificial consciousness, right, in AI is that 
I think we will just eventually reach a point where AI is so competent that we realize it's kind of a silly question, right? Yeah, and AI in the sense of general AI or more AI for specific tasks? More general AI, right? Like a Watson or something that's broadly applicable and can speak and understand voice input and all of that, right? Is that that will just reach a point where it's so competent that it's indistinguishable from interacting with another human. And then I feel like we just won't really care about the question anymore. At that point. Yeah. Yeah. Although it does bring up moral things, right? Of If that's true, then can you unplug it? Can you reset it? Right. Is it a slave? Like there's all yeah. sorts of questions then morally that come up. It's a good question. I, I I had this discussion with somebody recently about horses. Okay. It's like we, you know, little girls and some grown adults like ride horses, right, for sport and for fun. But, you know, a horse clearly has some level of consciousness, if you've ever been around one, and I can assume that they would prefer not to be ridden, right? Probably. Because yeah. it's it's certainly not a pleasant experience, right? It might be acceptable, but it's probably not awesome. And so is it animal cruelty to ride horses? I, I'm kind of inclined to say yes, right? Yeah. Like subjecting them to be beasts of burden. Yeah. I mean, if you extend that, then it would apply to a lot of animals that work for human purposes, basically. Yeah. No, that's true. Although it's interesting that we, I, I, at least in my head, I find horseback riding more objectionable than like killing an animal for food. Yeah. I guess it's because you're instituting further pain and suffering on it as opposed to just, you know, killing it quickly. Yeah, that's true. Because the horse horseback riding would be extended pain and suffering for pretty much a long, you know, a long time as opposed to just an instant, instant death kind of thing. Right. On, on top of being kept in stables which are not really a natural place for them to be kept and right. fairly socially isolated and um being driven around in cars and all of that hey it almost sounds like being an office worker <laughs> yeah exactly it's it's exactly like being an office worker <laughs> <laughs> you go to your stall <laughs> you get ridden around all day by your bosses yeah <laughs> and then you get transported in cars <laughs> you transported in cars <laughs> You have to get broken in. That's what the school system does. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. That's yep. too funny. It's a great analogy. <laughs> there you go. Um, but yeah, but then I guess you, those same questions would apply to computers if they were aware in that same way. Yeah. It could also be, I mean, my other thought on that is, is would they even want us to know, right? If it was that intelligent, like, does it have to make us aware that they that it's intelligent? Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's one of the kind of like classic AI scare things, right? Is that a, an AI sufficiently intelligent to be a threat to us will also be sufficiently intelligent to know it shouldn't let us know it exists. And so it would just be floating around on the internet without our knowledge doing its thing. There's that. And then, but see, I think as, as I said that out loud, I realized I was applying kind of like what Nagel's talking about here. I was applying my own viewpoint and trying to sort of extrapolate it onto this hypothetical AI. Oh, yeah. Um, if we think about what like any kind of consciousness or intelligence is, especially as uh, like Hofstetter talked about it, it all exists within its closed system, right? So it depends what system that AI came up under. So whatever its values were effectively. Right. Like that whole paperclip clip example is a very simplified example um, for people who aren't aware. Like, was it Bostrom who popularized it or did he actually come up with it? I think he came up with it. Yeah. So, well, just for people who aren't aware, basically the idea is that if if a um, artificial intelligence was told to optimize for paperclips or if that's what its goal was, it would figure out how to basically destroy the world in pursuit of uh, creating more material for paperclips. And that's kind of like a sort of a fear of um, of just AIs and how you define them and how you create their value systems. Yeah. Obviously, it's an oversimplified example, but my um, I guess my my point where I was going with that is it just depends what it was, right? Is it what I guess its goal was when it was created? But I guess that also assumes an intelligent creator. That assumes that a human or a team of humans is defining all this stuff as they go along and that it's not just an emergent property. Yeah. Well, and I would imagine, too, that any, you know, any machine sufficiently intelligent to contend with us would also be able to choose its own morals, right? You know, we don't really have any hardwired. I guess we do because our whole limbic system is pretty hardwired and 
we've got our cognitive system on top of it, but we'll be fairly, we'll be more driven by the limbic system in most cases, right? The protection of our own lives and the lives of our children and our... But do you think it could choose its own morals? Because that almost asks it to get outside of its system. Well, we we choose our own morals to a certain extent. To an extent, but the culture also shapes us that you're, you know, you're in. Obviously, you can choose some of that. So I'm not saying you can't choose any of it, but... Okay, so here's, I guess, so here's what I'm saying. Like, let's say an idea just didn't exist in our world. Mm -hmm. We couldn't choose that idea, right? Like, if we were not aware of an idea yet. Yeah. Like, basically, I guess here's a, here's something. Well, I don't, I mean, a good philosopher, someone might, right? Like, that's true. Every idea had to come from somewhere. So there is creation of ideas. Exactly. There is creation of ideas. But I guess what I'm saying is if, let's say, someone in the 1500s, um, you could say they could choose their morals, but they couldn't choose to study like quantum physics. Right. Right. Because like that idea just didn't wasn't there yet. So I guess what I'm saying, I don't know how that applies to AI. I'm, I'm like, I've tied myself up in a knot mentally. But <laughs> well, I, but I think that one's I think that that example doesn't hold because, you know, quantum physics in the 1500s wouldn't be a conceptual problem. It'd be an engineering problem. Yes, that's true. They just wouldn't have the science for it. But any philosophy is not constrained by engineering, right? That's true. I guess even if communism and Marx hadn't come along yet, somebody else could have come up with it. Yeah, I mean, somebody could have thought of it in China in 1000 BC, right? And probably did. And probably did. It probably was thought of before. Right? It just wasn't popularized. Exactly. So I don't see any reason that a sufficiently intelligent AI couldn't design its own belief system. Right. Based off of, you know, it just like digests all of philosophy in a few minutes and then says like, well, I'm going to follow my own variation on the categorical imperative, whatever. Right. Like that doesn't seem too crazy. As long as they don't digest Twitter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like the Microsoft one. It'll be like that, that Microsoft bot yeah. that turned into a <laughs> white supremacist, <laughs> like anti-woman, like just absolute piece of shit in <laughs> a matter of hours. Yep. That's pretty funny. Yeah, as long as they don't discover Twitter or Reddit. Basically, those are the two places to stay away from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or Facebook, I guess, for that matter. Or anything. Yeah. They just listen to maybe think. Just keep them off the internet in general. Just keep them off the internet. <laughs> Although yeah. that seems like the place it would emerge most easily. The internet? Yeah, I would imagine. Right? Yeah. Well, e Elon Musk actually brought something up interesting in his Joe Rogan interview, where one thing he mentioned is that, you know, he does see AI as a huge existential threat, but it also just might not really care about us, right? That's true, too. Because think about how much we care about chimps, right? It's like, oh, they're interesting. They're novelty. And we might like to go to the zoo and look at them. But, you know, no, nobody is going like, oh, we got to round up and kill all the chimps, right? Or we got to get all the chimps off the earth or anything like that. It's like, oh, we don't care. We're just, you know, we're so superior to them that we don't have to worry about it. Although, so that's that would definitely be true if we weren't a threat to them. But think about how we treat like mosquitoes, for example, right? It's like there's definitely efforts to eradicate mosquitoes, not like maybe eradicate, make extinct. But but that's because mosquitoes can threaten us. Exactly. Right. So I'm saying if there was if an AI was like ever under the impression, this sounds so hypothetical, but <laughs> yeah. just go with me. Uh, if an AI was ever under the impression that, oh, humans might cut off my power supply or I don't know, might do something else that will cause me to overheat or I don't know. Like, like, you see what I'm saying? Right. If we could be a threat. Exactly. Where if we were just a novelty, then I don't think the. I mean, it doesn't seem like there'd be a problem. Yeah, I don't see why I would care. We'd probably be like the animals in the zoo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're like, oh, look at that cute person thinking they are doing this. <laughs> yeah, well, what? What book was it? It would be funny as if we're already like that. If the AI is just hanging out on the internet, like watching us. Watching Reddit, watching Twitter, listening to podcasts. It's actually, it created all of this political shit that's going on just as entertainment. Yep. <laughs> just like screwing with the silly hairless apes. <laughs> that's what I would do. If I was like a super intelligent AI plugged into the internet, I'd be like, all right, I'm just going to fuck with some people. This is going to be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be pretty funny. That'd be pretty funny. We got to cover super intelligence at some point. Oh, yeah. That's a tough one. It's a tough one, but it'll be cool. Yeah. Maybe we can get Bostromon for that. Maybe, yeah. Or Elon Musk, whichever one's available. Yeah, whoever's available. They'll have to adjust to our schedules, of course. Exactly. They have to be available at Friday at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> we can move an hour or two for them. But Exactly. I feel like we've kind of exhausted the article. It's been a good tangent episode. Yeah. Oh, you know what? There is one other thing we should talk about, which is this use of the term is. Mm, yeah. 
So one thing we haven't talked about from the the essay is his is Nagel's point about, and this is a syntactically difficult thing to explain, <laughs> but basically that you can know that something is something without understanding what it means for it to be that thing. So the example <laughs> he gives is uh, people are now told at an early age that all matter is really energy, right? This is the E equals MC squared equation. Uh, but despite the fact that they know what is means, most of them never form a conception of what makes this claim true because they lack the theoretical background. So basically what he's saying is that you can know that something is true without understanding how or why it is true. And you can be right about that thing. And this like this is actually kind of a bigger statement than I think it comes off as in the article because there's a, a fairly popular idea in epistemology, or at least there was for a while, that knowledge is a justified true belief. So something that you something you believe that is true and that you believe for good reasons. Right. But sort of what Nagel is saying here is that you can know something that is true with no justification and that still counts as like knowledge and being right Mm. and i think what he's equating it to here is that there's stuff we may know without any real like theoretical background for knowing why we know it right that makes sense which is probably true for a lot of knowledge right we've talked about this in other episodes but it seems that the knowledge of something comes before the theoretical understanding of why that something is true. Yeah, that's very true. Right? It seems like that's kind of true for many things. Even I guess even the idea of like keeping yourself clean, right? Or washing your hands or I know washing your hands took a long time to catch on, but yeah. Actually probably a better example is boiling water and drinking tea as opposed to drinking room temperature water. Mm-hmm. So many cultures have boiled water drinks or fermented drinks, both of those. And they just probably I mean, I'm sure they realize that drinking regular water is not safe which is why those cultures never really that wasn't really part of the experience even now if you go to certain parts of europe like people just don't drink regular water it's not part of the culture yeah well i I was amazed by that when i was in europe i was like how are they not dehydrated all the time exactly (laughs) that's what i always thought yeah you go to lunch and they don't put water on the table you've got to buy bottled water right or you can buy beer which is usually the same price as the bottled water right exactly it's like well (laughs) i I guess i'm just gonna get a beer then (laughs) it's more fun anyway yeah, I always wondered that. And then, I mean, you see Asian Asian cultures, it's tea is consumed at almost all di- all times. Yeah, you go to a you go to an authentic Chinese restaurant, you don't get served water, you just drink tea. Right. Which I like personally. Yeah. I think it's nice. Tea and beer. Well, I guess tea makes a little bit more sense because you're probably not actually does tea dehydrate you? No, not at all. No, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like coffee I know can dehydrate you. I think it's a fairly compelling argument for how Asia was so dominant technologically for so long. They weren't drunk all the time. They weren't drunk all the time. (laughs) Yeah. It's like Europe really only surpassed Arabia and China in, you know, the Renaissance period, which, you know, some would argue happened because they discovered coffee. Right. And so everyone was drinking coffee instead of wine. And that's going (laughs) to make a pretty big difference in your productive output. Yeah. Yeah. You know what's wild is that we are probably speaking English right now because of two things. One, the happenstance that Europe is closer to North America, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then two, that they discovered coffee instead of uh, drinking wine or beer all day. <laughs> well, and I would say World War Two And World War Two. W- winning that definitely helped the... Yeah, it made a big difference. Continuing to speak English over here. Yes. <laughs> and maybe the Cold War. I guess we could be speaking Russian, right? Have you ever watched, uh, what is that, Man in the High Castle? No, is it good? No, no, I haven't watched it, so I don't know. Oh, okay. I found out recently, though, it's based on a novel, so I didn't know. I didn't realize that. I think I've seen the novel in airports. Mm. It sounds familiar. Probably now, because there is a show. Yeah, because the show. It's probably coming back. Yeah. I don't think it's that new of a novel. Oh, no? Yeah, let me see. Novel is from 1962. Okay, yeah. Fairly old. It's set in 1962 as well, 15 years after an alternative ending to World War II. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's right. It's that one. Okay. Um, have you ever heard those stories? This is a wild tangent. You ever heard those stories of Japanese soldiers fighting well after the war is already over? Yes. Well, that was in it's the latest hardcore history episode. Yeah, exactly. That's where I that's where I had heard about it. 
Yeah. There were there was someone still fighting till 1974. I know. It's insane. And like a kid had to go into the woods and like live with him for a while to try to talk him down from killing locals in what the Philippines. It's amazing. Yeah, that was that was Philippines. Yep. Yeah. Then there's a guy who died in 2014. He's the guy. Yep. He's the he's the guy actually. Hiro Unoda. Yeah, Hiro Unoda. He's the guy who was in there for the longest, I think. Yeah. His former commander traveled from Japan to the Philippines to informally relieve him from duty in 1974. That's right. Jeez, 30 years later. That is wild. Yeah. But yeah, then he he only died in 2014. 29 years living in the Filipino wilderness. That's incredible. That is dedication. Seriously. That's amazing. All right. Anything else in the essay we should cover? Short episode today. Yeah, short episode. Unusual for us, but I think that's fine because our last one was was quite long. Yeah. Well, most of ours are quite long. Most of ours so. are quite long. Yeah. We got we to gotta sprinkle in a short one occasionally. Exactly. And you know what? This, this is the first short piece, I think, to break our rule of exceptionally long episodes for short pieces. Yes. The inverse relationship between mm-hmm. <laughs> the length of the article. Didn't hold for this one. Yeah, didn't hold. But that's... But this topic was I think we I think we covered a lot of it and I think it relates to a lot of the other episodes we've done so I highly recommend you know if you enjoyed this topic if you've read this piece and you thought it was interesting um, I guess other episodes that I'd really recommend that we've done is GEB number one yep. uh, go to Lesher Bach early episode one of the first 10 it's I think it's number 12 oh 12 okay well a little later than I was expecting um, yeah so one of the early episodes uh, sapiens I still think was, would be relevant to this so the whole Sapiens series. Yep. Sapiens and Homo Deus. Homo Deus, yep. Uh, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, Beginning of Infinity. I think those are probably the main ones. But this is a topic we've talked about a lot. And if you listen to those episodes, you know we've mentioned this one. Yeah. This uh, piece. So. And you know what? I got to check something quickly because I wonder if this might be our our one year anniversary. Ooh. This episode. No, it's not. Because we... 52 already came out. Yeah, but 52 isn't the one-year anniversary because we released three on the first day. Yes, you're right. Um, Let's see. Okay, so actually Moonwalking with Einstein was our our one-year anniversary, it seems. So missed by a couple episodes, but... We both forgot the anniversary date. I know. Next year we'll remember. (laughs) Yeah, thank you all for joining us on this journey this past year. This has been... It's been a lot of fun working on this podcast. This has been fun. Yeah. It's basically taken over our reading lives which is fine because these are all interesting topics <laughs> well but in a good way too because there's a lot of stuff that i don't think i would have gotten through if i didn't have the the push of this podcast exactly and the fact that there's people listening to it really makes us finish some of these books too <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> like foucault is one i probably wouldn't have pushed through we, we not only have to finish them we have to take notes on them and try to understand them yeah so no it's uh it's been good and definitely looking forward to many many more Yes. So if you are enjoying this show, uh, there are many ways you can support it. You can, first and foremost, you can join us on Patreon. So patreon.com slash made you think where you get our notes for each episode. So our detailed highlights and annotations of the books and articles that we cover. Uh, You get a place to discuss the episodes with us and other supporters and uh most fun you get our bonus recordings that we do before every episode that are kind of you know off topic pure tangents lots of fun i think the one for this episode was 45 minutes long so they're almost as long as the episode (laughs) yeah almost as long as the episode They're, they're fairly substantial bonus materials so if you enjoy the podcast and want more of neil and i bantering on about things that that's an excellent place to get it uh and you also get access to the the monthly hangouts if you join at the the top tier where we'll just hang out with you and talk about whatever once a month and we did the first couple and they've been a ton of fun so uh make sure you sign up before what is the date i'll, I'll just say mid-october yeah October. sign up before then make sure you get access to the next one but yeah those are a ton of fun and uh you get to ask your questions and whatever you're thinking you can talk about i think the last couple we did in a more informal format i guess depending on the number of people we would do um maybe more of a traditional uh patreon hangout or we might continue doing the same format we're not sure yet just a complete clusterfuck of everyone trying to talk at once exactly (laughs) but yeah i mean i aside from that you can support the show by telling your friends about it so we grow pretty exclusively by word of mouth so we super appreciate any 
uh, referrals to friends. You can leave a review on iTunes. That obviously helps the show uh, get, you know, primarily because it will help us attract more guests for the show. And uh, yeah, definitely leave. um, So if you've already left a review, thank you so much for doing that. Also, we really like getting your book recommendations. Yes. Yeah, we we really appreciate everybody who keeps sending us either it's tweets or emails. And um, I even got an Instagram DM from somebody <laughs> suggesting a book that was actually a pretty good recommendation. I was gonna uh, I was gonna text it to you later on. So nice. Yeah, some interesting stuff that comes on there. So uh, yeah, appreciate everybody sending those recommendations, no matter what format you're sending them in. We definitely have picked books before that readers have suggested. So. Yeah. Yeah. Keep doing that. Off the top of my head. Beginning of Infinity, right? That was a reader recommendation. What else? There's definitely been more than one. Yeah. I think there's been a few. Let me, let me see. Uh, oh, um, UBI. The um... Well, I found that from Sam Harris. That wasn't a recommendation. Oh, okay. So you got that one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So maybe just the one, but <laughs> we could do more. We could do more if you send us more book recs. Definitely. Yeah. So definitely send us put your book recs and uh, we keep track of those. And um, yeah, I think that's where at least I've heard of a lot of good books from there. Obviously, can only do one a week um, and we're covering some long ones in the future. So, <laughs> yep, we've got our next uber long book in Ooh. the works. Yeah. Got to join the Patreon to find out what that is. So you can read along. But yeah, I think that yeah, pretty much covers it. I think we, we did it. We did it. I think, oh, if there's any other, there's one other way you can go support the podcast. Um, you can go to madeyouthinkpodcast.com slash support. There's a few other ways you can go support us there. Easiest being just shop through the Amazon link and just buy whatever you buy and take some money from Jeff Bezos and give it to us. Exactly. We much appreciate it. Yep. Cool. Cool. All righty. We will see everyone next week and or in the Patreon. See you guys next time.